Our next speaker is Professor Jim Liu from Harvard, the Federal Institute of Statistics in Neural Networks. That's Professor of uh, Welcome, Professor. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to uh, attend this conference, so I'm very proud of the uh, main organizers. Uh, yeah, I was not planning to give a talk uh, until the last minute to uh, ask to fill in for someone. Uh, so I happen to have been uh, discussing some of this uh, neural network stuff, stuff with my colleagues and friends uh, uh, from UCLA. And then I, I found them by experiments. So we, we did some experiments over the past few months from my groups and especially some of the uh, visiting students from uh, USTC and also from my current uh, graduate students and postdocs. And there's something, I think it's still a lot of things to think about, but I think it's uh, kind of interesting to apply some neural network ideas to classical statistics problems. So there's something to think about, like uh, this deep neural networks and CNNs. And, uh, uh, although after like 50 or more years since the neural networks was first proposed, I do not think there's any uh, conceptual breakthroughs so far. A lot of people have been talking about uh, how great the speed learning is, which, which I believe it is. Uh, but a lot of uh, uh, advances are really engineering. But I think it's, uh, it's definitely conceptually give us a lot more uh, uh, stimulus to think about that, to more motivate us. Uh, so anyway, so I think it's, it's interesting people uh, First realize it's really powerful as a way to represent human functions. On the other hand, it's still very perplexing. And if you if you go back to think about how we do is uh, with curves or with trends, we start with Gauss's uh, least square fitting to fit a line through things. Why do we fit a line through things? Well, it's uh, it's a trend, capturing trend, it's simple. Then we fit uh, like the, a, a curve, a polynomial. 2 degree polynomial, 3 degrees polynomial, it's becoming more and more flexible. And trying to capture some nonlinearities, that's, that's how it goes. And then it's sort of human way of building complexities. We add some basis functions, we do Fourier transforms, and we also have basis functions that start from more uniform, then start to get more wiggles. That's always our human ways. Uh, if you think it back, it's not, not obvious why we should do that, if you are not doing it, actually. That just seems to be more suitable for our own learning process than the than, 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 than reality. So neural network seems to be uh, challenging us in terms of how how we think about uh, uh, approximating some some common functions. Let's build a, a complex neurons, a very complex structures, and then uh, then it can be used for approximating functions. But the puzzling part is why didn't we sort of actually just get the wiggles? So you can collect all the points yourself without so using any machines which get the perfect fitting and no general likability, just connect the dots. Uh, but why the machines not doing that? That's kind of perplexing. Uh, in some way, it's actually behaving quite similar in some sense to our older human approach by using basis function to process. We start with simpler or less more rigorous structures and then start to add the flexibilities. Uh, if you think about neural network training, it's a little bit like that. Initially, it's like every training data is, is adding some force to bend it a little bit. But neural networks is infinitely bendable. So you can bend it anyway. It's more flexible than just humanly adding basic functions. But still, it's sort of, if you think about training data, it's really giving you a a pass going through the function space. And if you don't control it, it's always the overtrain. So there's no such thing of no overtrain. It will overtrain. But somehow you use some other external things like the validation data or cross-validations to actually stop you along the way and say, OK, that's my good problem. So I think that's, that's somehow this trajectory seems to be the same. Giving us and this trajectory somehow flexible enough. Uh, that's my heuristic understanding. Uh, so anyway, so but this we, we have been why is we have been thinking about why this could work, which I, do, I think we need real fundamental brains, uh, brain and 
conditions for the electric things through that. But on the other hand, we can actually use these flexibilities and try to see whether it, uh, it helps us. Uh, so, so it seems the training data is guides us, uh, especially with the uh, stochastic gradient descent. It seems to be that's that's actually another magical aspect of the machine learning. And there's some recent progress along this line from the statistician's perspective. If you actually can think about fitting a linear equation uh, with many predictors using stochastic gradient descent, so that's the simplest enough structures to think about what. The, this stochastic gradient descent is trying to do. Uh, interestingly, that actually gives you a good answer. It gives you a perfect, uh, well, if you P, that is number of predictors, is more than the number of samples, you will always get perfect fit. But if you do stochastic gradient descent, they actually give you the best of all fit, in the sense that that, that, that give you the, the sort of smallest, uh, sort of, and there's some least square periods. Uh, now, not least were, least were uh, error is zero, but they give you the norm, the, the smallest norm among all those uh, zero error uh, models. It's like a rich regression, but with rich primary converting to zero. Uh, so there's some theoretical study of doing that. Uh, but somehow, uh, this phenomena will apply to more complex neural networks, and actually it's uh, Giving out some magic results where you have almost no training errors, but the generalization is actually very good. So uh, it seems like stochastic gradient descent is uh, has something to do with this, this nice, nice feature. Uh, so that's the uh, this is sort of by recent work from some of my colleagues. And we have been thinking about also variable selection frameworks uh, in this setting. So variable selection among simpler models, like mean linear regression models, has been quite a hot topic among statisticians or applied mathematicians, ranging uh, from fancy name like compressive sensing to all the way. It's really just a least square fit in this uh, variable selection. You select some uh, sort of more sparse signal but there are different names but essentially you are trying to find uh, the model with, uh, with fewer non zero parameters and if you put this in the scientific framework there might be some interest in actually knowing which variables are non zero variables so we call it variable selections and there are some recent works on linear models how you select how you judge whether your selected model is truly uh, sort of good or not, and of how you estimate the number of false discoveries among the non-zero uh, variables you, 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 you selected. And this falls into the, the uh, another very active area in statistics called the false discovery rate, and try to pre predict what's the false discoveries. And if you put in the neural networks, there's also uh, interest in knowing like which of the uh, input variables are actually uh, useful or are, are good predictors and the future and some of these features may not be. And this problem may not be always useful. Like if you have a graph, you try to classify them. They, they may not be uh, fitted into this framework, but in some other uh, case, they might be a useful uh, phenomenon. Like if you apply to some medical data, you try to predict a certain kind of disease. And doctors cannot really allow themselves to use a, a black box neural networks to tell them that this guy should be treated with this particular drug because this particular neural network told you that the was high probability. They do want to know like what are the factors which may be reasonable. Then they try to reason, although they may not be very good uh, or even anywhere better than your, your neural network prediction, but they want to reason uh, for my reason. So in this sense, we probably want to say oh, for each variable whether it's, it's actually having an effect. Uh, so there's uh, some some studies in this direction as well as inspired our thinking. They're trying to just uh, do some kind of perturbation. Uh, this this was inspired by some of the uh, work, uh, recent work by BUE's group in UC Berkeley. They're trying to understand the model perturbations and data perturbations, how this affected our scientific results. 
Uh, so for one special aspect of, of this whole framework, we think we can apply to actually neural networks to, to do some perturbation for each variable and try to see whether that will affect some training results. Uh, in this case, we actually, for each variable, we can create uh, a pair, we call it the mirror variables, that is the original variable plus the noise and minus the same noise, so they sort of create a mirror of contrast. If its effect is really good, then they, they, they tend to have, both have uh, larger coefficients because, because their noise effect will be canceled out because they have exactly the same noise. So if they have the same coefficients, the noise goes away. But if they're more noisy, then they're, they're, this, this two coefficients will not be very uh, different. Or, so they create this uh, particular statistic. For linear model, this works really well. It's actually, so for, even for, for some of uh, this, uh, uh, this models, we did some simulations. So we can see that uh, this is another work which motivated us. We saw their ideas was good, but not as good. So that's uh, their results for truly uh, uh, sort of, these are truly null variables where they don't have any effect. Uh, so we have a simple neural effect for three layers. But it's still nonlinear. And uh, there are only like 10% uh, uh, of, 5% uh, five, five of the variables are sort of uh, useful, and the other 95% are just noise. So these are sort of noise variables, their test statistics should be close to zero. Uh, those no useful variables should be larger. So you can see in our so-called mirror statistics, you can separate these two classes very well. Uh, so you can actually uh, use some kind of uh, test statistics based on this symmetry here. They're almost symmetric. They're not quite. In the linear model, they're quite sym symmetric. So you can actually use the negative part of estimate the positive part. Uh, but in the nonlinear model, they're not quite symmetric, so they need some tuning there. And, and this is the results from this work motivated us, which they call it the pink. And although they, they still have pretty sharp concentration for this so-called null variables, but they are, uh, the informative variables are sort of not as separated as this, so there's an issue of lack of power. So that's, that's, a, that's a contrast from their earlier methods. And their earlier methods was to uh, create whole pairs of uh, fake variables, like trying to create this pair uh, of variables and to see which one has a stronger effect. Anyway, so related to this work, uh, which I think some sort of simple statistical methods may be useful is the, for network compression. And this work has been going on for quite, quite a bit in uh, CS. It's actually hard to publish this kind of result in CS conference because people say, well, we just prove them by, uh, by weight. By weight, uh, it seems to be quite effective. So the network pruning is really just get rid of the connections, which you seem to be unimportant. Uh, first, it's saving the space, uh, saving the, the storage. And also, it give, sometimes they actually give you a, a less overfitting models, give you better results. And the current seems to be most popular and effective way of doing that is to just run the weights in the neural networks and then prune those, say, 5% of the very low weights and recursive units. Prune some away and return them and prune some more. And eventually, they can prune a lot. Actually, it's easily pruning like 95% of the edges, or even 99% of the edges. Uh, so to, to reduce to a very simple, a much simplified model, but still have uh, equal or even better uh, prediction. Uh, we were just interested in testing uh, statistical ideas when we try to prune a particular connections. We try to use some statistical testing ideas, that is to test the conditional independence. Because when we say, oh, these are just uh, turn this into this smaller framework. When we say these two variables have or have not connections, we were really saying that if they need connection, if they have some kind of interaction to affect the uh, results. Uh, if, if they don't have interaction, if they separately uh, 
have their effects on the final results, there's no need to connect them. So that's sort of the, the idea. So if they independently contribute to Y, or one contribute, one doesn't <coughs> contribute, then there's no, no necessity of connecting them. So in this case, we just need a statistical model to test whether they exist, uh, actually exists. That, that part, we can do some number metric uh, testing methods. And based on this thinking, we actually do uh, statistical based uh, pruning to prune away those uh, non significant connections. And we apply to some of the CZ data sets. We're trying on some more complex data sets. Uh, this is uh, the NAT5 uh, or MINIST data. And just to uh, test of concepts, uh, if you maintain about uh, same error rate, and you can actually do uh, 68%, and this one is 10.7%, uh, uh, the test was seven times pruning. So it's to prune away like uh, uh, most of the edges in this case. Uh, we're still testing on some of uh, this uh, CN type of models. We don't have uh, this convoluted neural networks, the connection is more complex and higher dimensions. So we're still testing on that. Anyway, so uh, there's another uh, related idea is uh, so-called uh, basic hierarchical model. This is a more statistically oriented problem, where typical statistical model is saying that uh, you have parameters discover your observations, and they have some kind of prior distributions, or some, or if you're, you're not basic, you don't like the prior distributions, you use MLE to, to estimate the theta. That's sort of classical statistics, or if you're basic, you have a prior elastic data. And the slight extension of this model is hierarchical model, that is uh, saying that each of the data has its own parameters, but this parameter follow a common distribution. Uh, they typically, uh, these are called hierarchical models. And in reality, you may or may not really know whether all the same are all, all the same or not. Uh, so you especially in cases where you have so-called outliers. And this could well, very well be an outlier model. Some say that we follow the distributions. So we can actually use some of this uh, 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 auto-encoder type of ideas, uh, or, or this uh, gun ideas. Uh, that is, we generate, we try to think about following. That is, we think about this uh, uh, this transformation. We call it GPS. It's a generated uh, posterior sampler. We try to think about having some uh, neural network to encode this particular unknown distribution. And then let's generate this theta. And then this theta will create Y. We try to this generated Y with observe the Y to fit them, to make it they have to, to make them seem similar or have the same distribution. In that way, we can actually create some kind of uh, so-called hierarchical posterior distribution for theta. And so I will ignore the details for you. But So this is one typical example. Suppose your data is actually two regression lines. You didn't know, just say there's an access. Why? You never know they should fall into two lines. If you do classic linear regression, you will find some line here, which is completely wrong. Of course, you should be able to see it once you see the data. Uh, so that's the posterior distribution of, the, assuming all they have the same, same coefficient, then you're actually right in the middle, which is completely wrong. On the, other, on the other hand, if you allow this kind of flexibility, you actually can have two modes. You can do the same thing. And another idea is related to this uh, so-called model, model checking ideas. Actually, this was motivated. This was initiated by Professor Tom Ruby like 30 some years ago about this uh, procedure checking. Very well known among uh, uh, Bayesian statisticians, as essentially trying to check whether the model is good by making predictions and trying to see the predicted data and the real data, observed data, whether they look similar. This, uh, in some sense, is similar to this kind of idea. It doesn't create an encoder decoder to map back, it's just the one way. And if you use Bayesian, actually, this one 
uh, has long been criticized by the, the, the classical statisticians because they are not really p value. Although they give you some indication, they are not really real p values. But it uses Bayesian uh, hierarchical uh, framework using the, the neural network. Uh, you can actually get pretty good p values and have very good uh, separation. So, in other words, if you have two models, uh, one is under the null hypothesis, meaning that the, the, the model actually is good, then uh, then you have you have the so-called predicted p values. It should be uniform. If you have a p value, it should be uniform. But if you use a classic way, they are more concentrated on large values. It's not a big problem if you have p value about 0.5. It's not the issue. But they're not uniform. So not classic p value. Then if you compare the alternative, if the model, if the model is wrong, you can see the posterior predictive checking in the down Rubin's framework seems to be less powerful than this. This one has a small concept. Anyway, so that's a uh, uh, that's some of the, uh, the work we did. Uh, we also tried this uh, measurement error model, uh, uh, which which also has been kind of a problem for statisticians, and uh, especially it's very hard to do it on higher dimensions. So uh, what is so this is the, uh, the we. we so part the, 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 the trouble with the Merriman arrow model is that we have observed W, which is noise aversion of U X, and we have also response Y, and and uh, we don't really know how, uh, how we assume the noise variance, the distribution is known, but in a non parametric fashion, we don't know how Y is related to, to X. And this problem actually has two aspects. If you are only interested in prediction, you can directly fit the neural networks to W to Y. That's fine. But if you're interested in more intrinsically how F behaves and what is the uh, prediction on X parts, then you sort of have to consider these uh, structures. And you can still use uh, these neural networks to. Uh, to do the to do the fitting to optimize this, anyway. So these are just some comparisons of the results. There. So I will try to quickly finish this up. So I think it's exciting for us to look at the uh, the power of this uh, deep neural networks, and it's very suggestive, and but it's also very complex. It's still confusing to us. We, we, I think at one time, at, at one aspect, we found them extremely useful in fitting this kind of non parametric models in the classical statistics framework. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, very hard to quantify theoretically how it behaves. Uh, not as easy, at least not as easy as the classical way you use this kind of basic functions using this uh, smoothing splines. Uh, but again, I think it's, uh, it's a good time. Think about such uh, challenging, challenging questions. Thanks. We have time for one short question. Yes, so, if the network uses like the piecewise linear units, like the rail, so can you analyze it? Is simplified or uh, units are right? I mean, it's already on your hybrid. Potentially, but we, we weren't able to do real world. We, we are reading some of the existing literature on so, uh, various types of uh, like smooth things. I think they are, they are uh, substantially similar. Okay, thanks, Professor.